Our first speaker this morning is Morgan Smith. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to echo some thanks to the Alcoa Research Institute and City of Monticello for putting on this conference. Um, it's doubly special for me because not only do we get to come and uh, talk about our local research to the community that supports our, our work and logistics throughout the year, but um, I'm also from uh, 20 minutes just down the road, so it's also kind of like a homecoming to my, my local area. And I really like the theme of this year's conference, Old Stories and New Beginnings, because in a way that perfectly encapsulates where underwater archaeology and archaeology in general in Florida is right now. We're kind of standing on the shoulders of giants while at the same time pushing the, the field forward in new directions. And I think that the guest mammoth site in the Silver River is uniquely suited to the old stories aspect of this, um, of this conference. And in fact, it's probably, arguably, the oldest story in terms of underwater archaeology in, in Florida. So let's, uh, let me take you on a little journey through the guest mammoth site, including the history of it and what's going on now. So just for a little bit of geographic context, uh, the Silver River is located in the Central Valley Physiographic Province of Marion County. And the Central Valley is um, bounded on either side by uplands and is a, a lush, low, karst valley in the middle of the uh, county. And it's always been an ecologically diverse and, um, and lush region. So the Silver River is located in this area. And in 1973, something remarkable happened in the Silver River. For the first time in the Americas, a precise, controlled, professional underwater archaeological excavation was conducted on a submerged prehistoric site. That excavation was directed uh, by this man, Dr. Charles Hoffman, and he was a professor at the University of Florida at the time. And Dr. Hoffman put together a, a crew of undergraduate and graduate students from Northern Arizona University, where he, uh, he moved after he finished his, his work at UF. And in the bottom of, the, of a lazy bend in the Silver River, uh, Hoffman and his students found some pretty amazing stuff. What they found were three Colombian mammoths buried in intact um, sediment deposits in association with uh, diagnostic stone tool artifacts. And this was pretty amazing because a lot of people at this time held some pretty entrenched views about um, theories regarding how people first entered the continent and where they settled and, and how they migrated through it. And Florida didn't fit into any of those models. So this site, um, which appeared to date to the last ice age before about 12,700 years ago, really threw a curveball at a lot of things. And unfortunately, uh, Hoffman was unable to convince the critics and um, his colleagues of what he had found. And the site was more or less abandoned. And Hoffman passed away in 2005, and with him went a lot of the memories from the original excavation. Um, following his death, a lot of the artifacts and um, the records are missing. And so if we're going to answer some pretty important questions about the Guest Mammoth site, such as how old is the site actually, is it actually an archaeological site, or is it just a jumbled mess at the bottom of a river? To answer these questions, we have to go back to where it all started in a little narrow bend of the Silver River. So I'm going to start off. Um, and kind of divvy this talk into two parts where we'll talk about the old story and, and the new discoveries at the end. So part one, the old story. When people think of tourism in Florida, they think of sunny beaches, you know, Miami, Fort Walton, um, Florida Keys, maybe St. Petersburg. Um, but the reality is in, in central Florida, it's always been quite a bit different. Uh, the, anybody who's willing to battle the mosquitoes and the humidity and the alligators and the heat um, in the central part of the state from early on, we're rewarded with some pretty amazing um, natural features. This is what Silver Springs Head Spring would have looked like uh, around the 1890s. So not a whole lot of development going on. And again, people who are willing to come to this region um, to see the natural wonders of Silver Springs were few and far between at this point. But a couple entrepreneurs figured that they could definitely talk people into coming here if there was just a little bit of infrastructure behind it. So this gentleman by the name of Samuel Howes purchased much of the land around Silver Springs in the late 1800s. And he was the first one to establish a hotel up by the Head Springs. And he actually chartered a, uh, a, a cruise boat to come up and down the Silver River from the Ocklawaha. And um, this kind of jump-started a lot of interest in the region. People were able to come up and spend the day uh, venturing around the spring. 
But it wasn't until around 1900 when a guy by the name of Philip Morell had an idea to cut the bottom out of an old boat that he saw lying around Silver Springs and put some glass window panes in the bottom. And the glass bottom boat was born. And ever since then, these boats have patrolled up and down the Silver uh, River, and they've allowed the public to immediately access the underwater environment through, um, through visual cues. And uh, Morell led a series of these early glass bottom boat tours in the spring, and the, um, the patrons got to feed the fish and observe an environment that until then um, they, they hadn't gotten yet to see. It was so famous that even uh, President Calvin Coolidge visited the area in the 1920s, um, took a glass bottom boat ride himself, as well as President Ulysses S. Grant before him. But when it comes to the development of Silver Springs as we know it as a tourist attraction, a lot of this comes back to two individuals. The first individual is Ross Allen. Ross Allen was a herpetologist and one of these kind of larger than life Florida figures. And Ross was pretty famous for doing a lot of kind of sketchy, scary things. So he would wow tourists by walking into a gigantic pit of rattlesnakes and milk them right in front of him um, in his boots. Um, and to draw attention to Silver Springs, he did a series of publicity stunts in the early 1920s um, to showcase just how clear the water was and to kind of show off some of the amazing reptiles in his, um, in his keep. So he battled this seven-foot alligator in 1925, and there were pictures taken of it, and it was kind of an immediate sensation. And on the, um, kind of not to be outdone by that, you know, he next battled an anaconda, 13-foot-long anaconda that was released in the head spring. Um, and they filmed this one, and this became an immediate sensation. The water clarity was amazing, and it captured everybody's imagination. Another person who um, can be kind of put the finger on for attracting a lot of tourists to the region uh, was this guy, Colonel Thomas Toohey. So Colonel Toohey was in charge of the jungle cruise at uh, Silver Spring State Park. And as part of a way to make the jungle cruise just feel a bit more jungly, uh, Colonel Toohey imported a troop of 50 rhesus macaques from Southeast Asia. And he put these uh, monkeys on an island in the Silver River, assuming that monkeys can't swim. And monkeys can, of course, swim. So they promptly all swam away, and now they live happily in many different regions of Silver Spring State Park. But this kind of added to the mystique of Silver River and added to the excitement. Um, and Colonel Tui would do his part by feeding the monkeys Coca-Cola or, or treats whenever they would come up. So these two individuals worked really hard to put Silver Springs on the map, and it worked. So Silver Springs went from an unknown little hotel um, in the middle of the swamps of central Florida into an internationally acclaimed tourist destination. Um, Hollywood got involved in cinema at the spring, includes uh, the early Tarzan with Johnny Weissmuller, uh, Creature from the Black Lagoon in the 1950s, as well as a series of Lloyd Bridges' uh, famous sea hunt uh, episodes were all filmed in the head spring. So Silver Springs became this gigantic tourist destination with postcards about its crystal clear water and its gigantic alligators and its local um, native peoples. And it drew tons of people from all over the world. And in the 1960s, the American Broadcasting Company actually acquired Silver Springs State Park for about $8 million. And they grew Silver Springs into this giant tourist hotspot that attracted almost, almost a million people every year. Um, and glass bottom boats moved up and down in kind of a constant flow of the river. At the same time, though, there was something really interesting going on underwater at Silver Springs. So for the most part, the tourism was kept on the surface. One of the earliest published accounts of submerged prehistoric archaeology in the state of Florida comes from um, this guy, Wilfred T. Neal, who explored the head springs of the Silver River Mammoth Spring uh, in the early 1950s. And Wilfred Neal noticed a series of projectile points that we now know to represent Ice Age human culture, so that's older than 12,700 years ago. And he found them in close proximity to uh, mammoth and mastodon bones inside the head spring. And so he got to thinking, wow, okay, these things are really closely associated. Maybe um, Ice Age man and megafauna interacted in Florida. In kind of the ensuing years, as Silver Springs gained more no notoriety and people started diving in and out of the spring, um, they found a series of artifacts that demonstrated for sure that there were Ice Age cultures living in the region. So for example, on the left you have um, a diagnostic Clovis point. So Clovis is one of the earliest cultures in North America. It dates to around uh, 13,000 to 12,700 years ago. So finding this point in Silver River demonstrates that those people were here. 
This artifact on the right-hand side um, is a carved elephant ivory foreshaft made out of extinct mastodon or mammoth ivory. So again, this demonstrates that people are in Silver Springs very early. So our story of the Guest Mammoth starts with a truck driver by the name of George Guest, who was kind of passing his time diving in the Silver River, and he noticed a, a bunch of really big bones eroding out of the riverbank. And he notified this gentleman right here, whose name is Ben Waller. And Ben Waller was uh, one of the most well-known and well-respected river divers of his time. He spent uh, most of his life exploring much of Florida's waterways. And he was kind of bent on demonstrating that Ice Age people and, and animals interacted. And the important thing in being able to do this is archaeologists really need three things to demonstrate a site. You have to have absolute, unequivocal, man-made artifacts. They have to be in secure geologic context, so stratified sediment layers. And it has to be associated with some material that can be absolutely dated so that you can understand whether or not the, those artifacts and that site actually predates 12,700 years ago. So he notified Waller, uh, George Gass notified Waller of this discovery, and Waller was really excited about it. And he thought this could be the one, this could really be the site. So he notified Charles Hoffman, who was a professor at the University of Florida. Charles Hoffman was also interested um, in trying to demonstrate that man and megafauna were interacting in Ice Age Florida. And so Charles Hoffman tried to scrape together kind of a motley crew to go after this site and, and really figure it out. And he applied to the National Science Foundation for funding and was rejected. He applied to the National Geographic Society for funding and was rejected. And eventually he, he went to um, the American Broadcasting Company and they underwrote much of his excavation. And of course, Uncle Roy can't be forgotten for providing the mobile home in this picture. Um, but uh, basically, he led this small crew of people um, on one of the earliest underwater prehistoric excavations um, of its kind. And Hoffman knew that he really, this could be his one chance to demonstrate once and for all that people were here very early in the southeast and in Florida in particular. And so he kind of went about trying to figure out how to precisely and accurately and scientifically excavate an underwater prehistoric site for the first time. And he, he developed and kind of refined a lot of the methods that we still use today. So he made this aluminum grid that was one meter by one meter square strung with um, piano wire at 10 centimeter intervals so that divers could kind of rapidly uh, measure out the location of artifacts underwater. And they left the entire bone bed um, that they excavated in place and they actually parked one of the parks uh, glass bottom boats over the site and they mapped the uh, site from the glass bottom boat and each time that an artifact was brought up, um, they would kind of review it together. So this was a really interesting thing and it was really, it was really going on strong in Silver Springs lore at the time. Um, ABC sent a film crew out to, uh, to kind of make a documentary about what was going on at the Guest Mammoth site. So what happened here? Why, how come this site that was so promising that ABC was gonna do a documentary on uh, kind of fell by the wayside? Well, as I mentioned earlier, um, Hoffman was kind of going against entrenched theories at the time that did not put Florida in its proper place um, where we know now that it belongs in terms of the story of the peopling of the Americas. So he had an uphill battle, not to mention the fact that this site was underwater and a lot of his colleagues at the time scoffed at the idea of having an intact underwater site. They were like, well, it's in a river. It has to be all mixed up. So when Hoffman presented his findings at the SAA conference, the Society for American Archaeology conference in Washington, D.C. in 1974, he was given an 11 p.m. slot <laughs> on the last night of the conference. That's the real program right there. That's actually, and I don't know if you guys know this, but nobody's attending an 11 p.m. conference on Saturday night, okay? So Hoffman bailed. He was like, okay, I'm sick of this. Um, I really don't want to put up with it anymore. And he moved to the Caribbean, where he carried out the rest of his archaeological career, only to return to the Guest Mammoth site in 2000, when he, was a, when he was retired from Northern Arizona University. And he started writing a manuscript about what he went through. And he never finished this manuscript, unfortunately, uh, because he passed away five years later. But I think it's really interesting that the title of his first chapter is The Frustrating Years. And interestingly enough, that kind of takes us well into my chapter on the site, which beginning of my work on the site was also frustrating. So now we're moving to the, um, to the next phase of this research uh, presentation, which is the new beginning section. So the first step was trying to find 
a lot of the archaeological material, or at least some of the records that Hoffman left behind. And I just hit dead end after dead end in trying to do this. I contacted the University of Florida, and they said, well, we don't have it. I contacted Northern Arizona University and said, we don't have it either. I contacted the Museum of Northern Arizona. I contacted uh, Florida Museum of Natural History. I contacted pretty much everybody I could. And eventually, I was able to track down Charles Hoffman's widow, who still lives in Flagstaff. And she was great. She said, yeah, I have all these random boxes of, of stuff that Charlie left behind. And one of them's labeled Guest Mammoth. Do you want it? And I said, yeah, please, send it on. And so she sent it. And along with it came many of the photographs that I'm showing you and a lot of key data that was really important in being able to reconstruct exactly what Hoffman did. So to the best of my ability, this is what Hoffman's excavation looked like. So this is the guest mammoth bone bed right here. And you can see, oop, here, here we go. Um, up top, you can see kind of the elements that are represented by animals. So Hoffman reports three mammoths, um, only two of which are represented in the faunal elements. But I'll kind of talk about why that may be a bit later. So the remains of, um, of three, three animals, a juvenile and a calf, interspersed in this bone bed were also these artifacts in addition to some of the bones which appeared to bear butcher marks, um, as well as this small non-diagnostic projectile point. So all of this stuff is starting to look like Hoffman really was onto something, and there were artifacts in association with the mammoths. The next step was to refine the site, which is actually way more difficult than I ever anticipated it would be. So I took Hoffman's maps, and I overlaid them on current aerial imagery of the site, and I did my best to kind of shoehorn in his 50-year-old maps into a dynamic river system and, and figure out exactly where in the river the Guest Mammoth site actually was. And in 2015, um, I did some of the early work at the Guest Mammoth site in trying to relocate it, where we used a technique called side scan sonar. Um, in 2014, we had gone to the site and we tried to dive around and identify where the site was, but we had no luck because over 50 years, uh, many things had changed. The river deposited a ton of sediment. There was no trace, really, of any of Hoffman's work. So we took a side scan sonar unit out to the site, which emits a high frequency sound wave out to the side. And then it measures the time and intensity with which that sound returns. And it paints this really nice underwater image of the landscape. And so as I was kind of reviewing these data, I noticed that there was this very rectangular feature uh, in the side scan sonar data. And when I zoomed in and measured it, it was 12 meters long. And that was the exact length of Hoffman's excavation unit. So I thought, OK, wow, we're really onto something now. This is nice. As kind of a final nail in the coffin for figuring out exactly where the guest mammoth site was, I started thinking to myself, and I was like, what else can we do to really narrow down where it is? I thought, you know, I haven't ever been through a field season where I haven't lost a trowel, a knife, a unit nail, or something underwater. So with archaeologists from the Bureau of Archaeological Research in Tallahassee, we took a magnetometer, which identifies metal. So it's inherently kind of useless for finding archaeological sites, but it's very useful for finding archaeologists, as it turns out. Because Hoffman did the same thing. And if you see down here at the bottom, these two red markers here, um, this one was an old diving weight buckle, and this one was a cluster of unit nails from their excavation. So we hit the nail on the head. And in 2017, we returned to the site to excavate it and fully understand what Hoffman was on to. So this is kind of a map of where we worked. To the best of my knowledge, the 1973 excavation block is about right there. So we kind of moved back a little bit further from it. And we had a little bit of difficulty actually identifying the mammoth bone bed at first. So we spent quite a bit of time in the water, kind of digging test pits and trying to find this surface that Hoffman reported the bones were on. And he interpreted this surface as a remnant pond feature from the late Pleistocene. And it was very compact and very hard. So if we saw it and we hit it, we knew we were there. And we weren't finding it for, for the longest time. So we had divers in. This is a four-week project. Um, we excavate underwater using pretty much an underwater vacuum that sucks the sediment up, and it goes to this kind of screen deck area here in the back. And so we were kind of looking and looking and looking, and we, we dug about a, a three by three meter area with not much luck. And we were getting kind of towards the end of the field season, and the final week, uh, Dr. Michael Fott came up from a dive, and he said, hey, dude, I found a big bone. Exact words. That's exactly what he said. So that became kind of a tagline for the project. And what he had found was um, the rib bone of a juvenile Colombian mammoth. 
so boom, all of a sudden we were right there on the site. We were digging exactly where Hoffman had dug 50 years ago and it was time to put his interpretations to the test. So this is what I was referring to when I was talking about um, secure geologic context. So remember, absolute artifacts, secure context, um, reliable radiocarbon or absolute ages. So the guest mammoth site is actually at the bottom of this sediment sequence here in the Silver River. And this is kind of the layer where the mammoths are on. And you can see the, this is kind of the pond surface that starts to dip down here. So we are at the edge of a Pleistocene pond. And I thought maybe, you know, we can at least redefine the stratigraphy of the site and figure out the geologic context a little bit better. Maybe if we get really lucky, we'll find some mammoth bones. And maybe if we get even luckier, we'll find some artifacts associated with those bones. And we got super lucky and we found all three of those things. So we found these uh, flakes and artifacts in direct association with the mammoths on this surface. And um, these are basically all little chips made from the stone tool production process. So we didn't find any tools or anything that was, was used to butcher the mammoths. Um, but these little chips and, and bits of debris showed up, as well as these teeny tiny artifacts. It's a one centimeter scale at the bottom. So these are very tiny little chips of um, what's called micro debitage. And these are usually um, produced when you're retouching the edge of a tool as you're using it. So this is kind of demonstrating to us that maybe these animals were butchered here. But we also found a series of these kind of um, big bones that all indicated to us mammoth. Um, and the interesting thing was that we found this very tiny tooth right here. And the interesting thing about the tooth and the way I think it le links back to the Hoffman's third missing mammoth is that when I sent that to a paleontologist at the University of Florida, they said, wow, that's really small. I think it's a fetal mammoth. And so what it actually looks like is that the, one of the two mammoths from the guest mammoth site may have actually been a pregnant mother. Um, it's hard to tell that for certain. Um, but that was uh, the paleontologist interpretation based on the size of the tooth. So on this surface, this gray area down here labeled unit two, that's the surface of the Pleistocene pond. And you can kind of see it's undulating a little bit. And right at the surface of that, we got an age on the sediments uh, that dated to 12,700 years ago. And so that puts us right at the end of the last ice age, you know, like I was referring to earlier. And once we got this age, we realized, yeah, okay, Hoffman's really onto something. Unfortunately, we were unable to control the age as, as much as we would have liked because the next age um, above the site is about 8,000 years ago. Those are reported in radiocarbon years, which are different from calendar years. Um, but it does look like on top of this surface, these mammoths were, were killed or butchered. These artifacts were left behind. And then after that, the Silver River started flowing, just like it is today, around 8,000 years ago. And following this, um, the, the site was buried in a, in a stratified sequence where it's kind of all the way ordered, all the way up to the top. So it's kind of amazing that 50 years later, we were able to go back to a place that um, Charles Hoffman had been kind of scoffed at for reporting as, um, as an archaeological site, and we essentially confirmed a lot of his original interpretations. So I got in touch with um, Cindy, Hoffman about, or, uh, yeah, Cindy Hoffman about this, and I told her, hey, you know, we, we went back to the Guest Mammoth site, um, and based on those records that you sent me, we were kind of able to, to more or less justify what Charles Hoffman did. And she said, I'm delighted to hear that. Um, you know, he always kind of talked about that site like with a chip on his shoulder, with a grudge. Um, so it's happy to hear that he was onto something overall. So that's kind of the story of the, the guest mammoth. And we've more or less wrapped up research there. We're still kind of trying to figure out some of the finer details about the site. Um, and then I just wanted to kind of leave you all with another new beginning at the end of the talk here. So as we kind of um, move on from the old stories and we start to make our own new ones. We've started looking at a series of different archaeological sites throughout um, the state of Florida, including some of these ones that have maybe never even been looked at before. And, and recently we've started working on a series of previously unreported um, prehistoric quarry sites that are inundated in the Gulf of Mexico. So who knows where, where this story will take us, but hopefully we'll be talking about it uh, the next conference in five years. So. Uh, thank you all for listening, and I have some time for questions if you uh, <laughs> if you're